so today's talk is titled An Introduction to Digital Accessibility. And my name is Zainab. Uh, so I'm currently uh, an assistant professor at Kuwait University and I do research in graphics, uh, HCI, uh, mathematics, accessibility and usability. Um, I grew into accessibility and usability most, more recently. Um, uh, I originally uh, studied other stuff, uh, mainly computer graphics and my PhD um, degree. Uh, once come to Kuwait, I started working in human rights area, so civil society. Um, it, and that's where my passion for accessibility began. So I surveyed people with disability here in Kuwait and I came to know more how difficult their experiences are online. Um, and that made me feel like I need to make a change. Similar to what Aravan just said, he wants to be, he wants to make a change or a good move for humanity. And I think we're, some of us are driven that way. And I'm glad I'm in that space too. Um, so since um, 2013, I also helped launch a few different um, grassroots initiatives, uh, Student Club, um, the Women Tech Makers, Art of Women in Computing, and Google Developer Group, um, the team that you're joining today. Some of my team members are here as hosts, so if you ever want to get to know them, please uh, introduce yourself. Uh, they do great things, uh, mostly awareness, trying to get people to upskill um, their knowledge in cutting edge technologies and um, using the resources we have. So it's all volunteering efforts. And more recently, I'm looking at um, offering some types of services and accessibility and usability, some consulting, and you can reach me on LinkedIn. Uh, just by typing my name, Zainab al Maraj, or you can email me. And I'll repeat the email later in the talk for those who uh, would like to uh, type it down. So what's this talk going to be about? Today we'll talk about uh, digital accessibility, uh, and I'll offer a short definition. I'll go over the accessibility or assistive technologies uh, and what they mean, and give you an overview of some accessibility barriers, um, and then cover some basics and, and then how to get started in uh, accessibility, uh, which I'm sure all of you can walk away today with at least one thing that you implement and um, adopt and implement and, and make technologies more accessible. So what is accessibility? Um, most of you are more familiar with the physical side of accessibility. So, for example, here you see a ramp going up to a building. And on the right side, there are steps, and on the left side, there is a ramp. And that um, essentially helps people in wheelchairs or built to help people with wheelchairs to um, reach. Um, this happens in different places. It might be a ramp to get into a shop or um, a movable ramp that gets you into a bus. Um, accessibility can be things like um, uh, elevator button that has like a, a braille um, text imprinted on it that people that are blind could uh, press to know where they're going or to know which number of floor they'd like to go to. So these types of physical accessibilities are essential. They came first. We're all more aware of them because of the uh, efforts in which we want to remove the barriers for them uh, uh, so that they can live normal lives, as normal as we are uh, living. Um, one cool example um, to accessibility is this uh, watch. Uh, and the watch is mainly, uh, on the left side, you see a watch that's designed for blind people. Uh, and on the right side, you're you're seeing a design that works for blind and others. And so that's where the concept universal design comes in. And that's designing for everyone, not with one person or one group of people in mind. So if you think about it, the one on the left, uh, the one designed for the uh, blind, has little buttons that uh, probably stick up like braille buttons that you can touch and read. Um, for somebody like me who never learned to braille, I would not be able to use it. So that watch is pretty much just a, a visual um, uh, thing if I'd like to wear one like that. Whereas the one on the left 
um, uh, pretty innovative. It's got these circle or small balls on the inside, one ball on the inside and one ball on the outside of the uh, rim of the watch. The inside ball uh, refers to the minute hand and the outside ball refers to the hour hand. So um, for anybody that can see and anybody that can't see, both of them get the purpose of the watch. They both are able to use it and, and enjoy uh, the aesthetic nature of that watch um, together. Um, another thing about accessibility is, for example, color blindness. Um, some people uh, have issues, or it's mainly a genetic um, issue in which some of your cones in, in the eye do not develop. So we have three cones in our eyes that take uh, or receive light and depending on the wavelengths of light, um, if the cones are not developed, they may not capture it. So that gives you the um, um, sort of um, a weakness in the level of sensitivity of colors that you can see. So in the picture on the left here, you can see a lens uh, on top of a uh, picture of a field of a flower, flower bed. The flowers are red, but on the left side, you see that the um, intensity of that red is not there. We can't see it, and it's more yellow. And there are different types of people with color blindness. Um, some of them uh, have blue, yellow color blindness that affect the blue hues, and some have the red, um, green uh, uh, color blindness. Um, and this is an accessibility issue. For people who um, have uh, a color blindness, they find it hard to see things. It might be on your website or on your uh, application. It could be uh, on places like um, the um, uh, uh, signs in, on the road. Um, these are critical things that they would need help with if they weren't able to see it. Um, it's not a, uh, an obvious disability, and some people don't know they have it. Uh, so it's very critical to understand um, um, those types of disabilities. Uh, the other one is the physical and digital signage. So um, icons re uh, give us a lot of visual uh, or act as a visual symbol, basically. Uh, and it quickly gives you the uh, ability to understand what it means, or it's supposed to be designed that way. Um, and um, they're meant to be usable. They're meant to be intuitive. Um, uh, but sometimes we get new designs that are hard to uh, understand. So it's very important to make things such as uh, digital uh, and physical signage that is clear to the point. And if it isn't, um, and you try it with people and you see it as difficult, then sometimes we might have to put text next to it. Um, like uh, WC makes more sense to people than just this image for some people. Um, this could be cultural, it could be um, um, international, uh, based on where you live, All right? Um, so that's an example of how to make things a bit more accessible. Um, this is an interesting one when it comes to gaming. So uh, what you have in a picture here is uh, a, a one a student uh, with a user, a person with a disability, who's sitting in a chair and he's wrapped up and strapped up to his chair. Um, and he's holding two things. He's got a joystick on one side and he has uh, another type of device that's movable uh, on the other side. And what they're doing here is researching how to make games accessible. And this is um, trendy at the minute. So Xbox has, uh, and you can see their Xbox uh, box here in the front. This is one of their newest devices. Um, to make accessible gaming for people. Um, PlayStation's also looking into um, developing a more accessible games. And how do they do that? So um, the certain things you want to do when you're playing first-person shooter games or whatever games you might be wanting to do, the certain buttons that um, you have to touch or play when it comes to controllers. And for people who can't, like this young guy here, he has to do it a different way. 
Uh, and you can see, for example, by his head is a button, um, this yellow button um, right behind his cheek. And what that is, is one way in which he can interact. So maybe he wants to jump and his way to interact with that would be to tilt his head and press the button. Um, and that would um, lead to a movement or interaction with the game. And so that's a different um, aspect of uh, inclusiveness when it comes to game development. So accessibility started, um, well, actually for video players, um, closed caption started for deaf people. So I'm, I'm not sure if all of you are aware what closed caption is. Uh, the CC button you have here um, allows you to, uh, to see written text of verbal communication or audio that's being read out in videos. And that's what I've boxed here in the red box um, is what Sahar, um, our sponsor last year, was saying when um, in one of our events. So she was at the point where she said the ability of making our own website will, um, which we usually see on uh, YouTube. Uh, another nice feature that came later was the transcript side, right? So the transcript here on the left shows you at every minute and second that that sentence came out uh, um, and kept, keeps going and highlighted with what she's being, what she's about to say, let's say. So she will make you visible in the world as a technology is um, always impacting positively in people's future. So um, these types of, uh, uh, inclusive technologies are making a world of a difference for people um, that can't um, interact with them a regular, like a regular person would, a person who's deaf, a person who might be blind, a person who might be um, uh, physically unable to open um, uh, the screens. Um, language barriers is another one, and we'll talk about them a little bit later. Um, so every day, inaccessible uh, web designs are preventing billions of people around the world uh, from having an experience or an easy online experience. Um, and what happens is when they enter that URL, they don't know what's going to happen um, beyond. They um, may face uh, certain barriers and issues, uh, and that's what brings us to our definition of accessibility. You can define it this way, as all technology, including websites, must be must grant uh, barrier-free access to people with disabilities. It's not the only definition, it's one of many. Uh, but I think it sums it up in a way that you can uh, realize and understand today with some examples on what these barriers might be. Um, okay, so I'll give you a small demo here because I'd like you to be in the context and, and understand where we are uh, and the examples I'd like to share with you after this is to show you a video of uh, by Sadie Paulson uh, who's a video editor at Apple uh, and I will open the um, YouTube here so that you can sh see that experience yourself I'll get you a question a bit later, Aaron McMahon. Okay. People think that having a disability is a barrier. But that's not the way I see it. <laughs> You can catch up with friends. Ready? You can capture a moment with your family. One face, small face, focus lock. And you can start the day bright and early. You can take a trip to somewhere new. You can concentrate on every word of a story. Oh, 
bird began to sing. Jack opened his eyes. You can take the long way home. Or edit a film like this one. When technology is designed for everyone, it lets anyone do what they love, including me. Okay, so that was Sadie, and I think that is pretty moving video. Uh, and thanks to I think it was um, Christopher Weatherstone who um, this talk I saw um, introduced her, uh, and I thought it was um, inspiring. And I hope you use it too to inspire other people around you. Um, so when it comes to and before I go on. Um, Sadie has a motor disability and a speech disability, so she can't really use her hands and legs and she can't really talk. So technology or the level of technology that she was doing as a video editor required the basic software that everybody uses to be usable in a way that she could um, understand and also uh, use. Um, uh, to achieve her videos or to make her videos such as the one she just did. Um, um, there are other types of disabilities like auditory, visual and cognitive. Um, included in um, the, t the term of or the audience that we're talking about when we cater to accessibility is not limited to people with a disability. It could be a person that's aging, like older people tend to lose vision. Um, I might have, for example, a, a problem with my leg. I, I broke my leg at one point and I, uh, it took up to two months to heal. So that's a disability or a temporary disability. These are other types of um, um, things we need to keep in mind. Uh, language is another barrier. So we see lots of people from all over the world that have different languages and might have different accents um, uh, and might create systems with certain people in mind and not put others. Um, one good example here is, for example, if I do movies, um, a lot of uh, audience or Arabic audience like watching foreign movies, but not all the time you find the transcripts in Arabic and they don't know the English. So that is a barrier itself when it comes to a language. Um, so in order to uh, address accessibility, we need to better understand the users uh, themselves uh, and what they use, uh, for example, as tools to achieve um, the things they need to do before we start designing the, uh, the systems that we want to design. So what type of tools do they use? Um, so uh, we call them assistive technologies because it's something that is additional to um, what they need to achieve a task. So a blind user will use something called a screen reader. And, the, and for us, we have screen readers installed in our mobile phones, um, like uh, VoiceOver on Apple or TalkBack on Android. Uh, and this will read the text um, uh, out loud for the blind user to know where they are and what they're doing. It will walk them through the page um, uh, so they can complete a task that they're there for or what they want to do. Uh, low vision. So people with low vision who wear assistive technology such as glasses um, would need something like a screen magnifier in certain cases. They may want to um, pinch the screen and make it larger, zoom in on a text, and this is uh, an assistive tech. Uh, deaf people, as we mentioned before, have use closed captions, um, and that's the main way they are able to understand what's in a vo audio conversation. For mobility or uh, people with mobility issues, a speech recognition could be a problem. So we have, for example, and we have um, a lot of cool tech now, right? So um, 
some people are experimenting with uh, being able to control their websites or um, chats or whatever it might be using speech. Uh, okay, it might work for people who do speak, but it might not work for those who don't. So always have an alternative, um, a second option, another way for them to continue doing it. Um, On-screen keyboards are another assistive technology that allow people who can't use buttons, uh, their hands to touch the buttons on the screen, uh, on the keyboard. Um, uh, another subset of uh, assistive technologies are those related to reading. You have people that have dyslexia or learning disabilities that have really hard time um, making sense of text. Uh, so there's certain things uh, or certain assistive technologies that allows them to um, control the text appearing or read it, read it in a way that um, is clearer for them. Maybe they're able to control the color of the background versus the foreground and uh, make it bold in a way that it doesn't feel jumbled to them, for example. And so I'll take a moment here and ask you, um, why you think digital accessibility is important before I go on with the rest of the talk. And I will go back to my screen to see your comments. Um, and please share if you're here and you want to share. Uh, until then, I'll answer Arivan's uh, question. I'm currently planning to create a web app. Is it possible to implement digital accessibility in web apps? Yes, you definitely can. So anyone can use web apps easily, or else this can be used in Android or iOS platform only. It can be used in any platform. Any technology has um, uh, can be created with accessibility in mind. Uh, Abdullah said, um, interact with each other in different ways. Definitely, um, interact with each other in different ways allows us to be uh, inclusive um, spread equality and um, not make anybody feel different and that's a key thing that we'd like to do or I, I'm advocating for under the umbrella of accessibility and I hope you do too. Um, Fatma shared to make the disabled people or people with disabilities rather it's a term that we like to use um, people with disabilities or people with um, people of determination is another one um, that um, UAE conceived as a term and a lot of people are liking that. No worries, I'd like, I'm spreading awareness, so forgive me for adding that comment. To make people more involved in our community, exactly, I love that and we want that. Um, Alhamdulillah in Kuwait, um, it, um, a lot more people with disabilities are mingling and coming out as opposed to maybe 10 or 20 years ago. We did not see people with disabilities on the roads or with us in the malls. Um, and by drawing attention to digital, digital accessibility, I think it's, it's about time and we can't wait any longer to um, start building and catering for them so that they are included and they are able to do um, everything we do or, or we'd like them to do. Great. So if there's nobody else that wanted to add, thank you, Fatma Abdullah and Rivand. I'll go back to um, the slides. All right, what are some accessibility, accessibility barriers? Um, so barrier number one, if you have audio content on a website, such as a video that has voices or sounds, but you don't have a caption or a transcript, then that is a barrier. So a deaf person will not be able to understand and they will miss out. They'll have to leave, basically, if they're not really, if they are not able to lip read. And that's another thing. Some people are able to lip read, um, but given that there's enough information there, they'll need like what language are the people speaking um, and stuff like that. Um, so good to keep in mind. Um, another barrier is complex navigation. Um, so um, on a page, for example, if I wanted to introduce some type of complexity with how I want people to go through my page, right? And um, if it's not intuitive and it's not similar to 
the majority of pages that people are used to, then it's going to be very hard for somebody to pick up. It could be a person with a cognitive disability or a learning disability, or it could be an older person like my father who might get confused and be like, okay, well, I don't know. It used to be like this, and now I don't know how to move. How do I do it? All right? So um, designing with accessibility of mind allows you to design in a way that you um, don't let people get overwhelmed. Okay. Uh, another barrier is uh, websites and web browsers, uh, as well as authoring tools. If you don't provide full like, keyboard support, then people that have a mobile disability, like Sadie, who we saw earlier, or people with a visual disability, may not be able to access the content in the right way and not be able to complete a task, let's say, by your items. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about keyboard support in a little bit. Another example is um, images and infographics. Um, so some people believe that the more infographics on a web page, the cooler it is. Um, the more controls on there, the cooler it is. Um, it could be, uh, and it depends on which purpose. But there's also certain things you have to do to make sure that everybody can access them and understand them. It could be a graph that's complicated, that doesn't make sense. Um, or it could be an image uh, that a blind person will not be able to understand because they use a screen reader to read it out. So if I have an image without an explanation or an alternative text explanation, um, then they won't know what's inside there. And it might be important for them to know before they proceed, um, depending on what the function of that website is. Um, so W3C uh, is the main international organization that sets standard for the World Wide Web, so the WWW. And if anybody knows the person who invented the WWW, um, right? So it's Sir T uh, Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, he was the one who created the W3C in 1994. Um, and right now it's uh, the foundation or the, the main um, organization that has the technical standards uh, on which the WWW um, uh, functions, basically. All right. So one of these standards is the WCAG, um, W-C-A-G. And that stands for a Web Content Accessibility Guideline. Um, and these uh, have been in place for a long while now. And the latest version uh, is a 2.1. Um, it's part of a wider or broader initiative called the Web Accessibility Initiative that has multiple other standards, and I have a lot of resources I can share with you a bit later. Um, so a little bit more about um, the WCAG standard, which is the Web Accessibility Standard. Um, it's designed around four principles, and it has a bunch of success criteria. And these success criteria are similar to um, small or short rules in which you should keep in mind when you're designing and building. Um, and it will eliminate, and each of those rules eliminates one type of barrier. And the, these rules are split up into levels. So you have level A, level AA, and level AAA. Um, the common standard is level AA. And that is inclusive of A. So it means if I design for level AA, I have to design for level AA and A, which means I have 50 success criteria to um, complete before I can say I'm accessible, right? Um, so this is an example from the W3C website. Um, it's under the first uh, principle. The first principle is perceivable, which means something that I can see. I have to allow people to see what's on my page. Um, the first sub uh, topic under perceivable is a text alternative. And we mentioned, or I mentioned that just now when I talked about images. Um, and then the first 
rule that comes under text alternatives is uh, concerning non-text content, which means an image. So I've added an image here at the bottom, and you can see there's a small, uh, small image on the right side of a mom dog and a puppy dog with a little pillow at the back, uh, or a colored pillow. So what that uh, success criteria says is that all non-text content that is presented to the user has a text alternative um, that serves the equivalent purpose except for the situations listed below and there's other situations that might um, fall under and this specifies that it's a level a uh, success criteria so when i add images to my website um, there's certain uh, places or tags under certain tags i can add alternative text or in social media if i wanted to post something i get an option now in linkedin twitter instagram and so forth to add alternative text, and that's allowing other people to see what's in your images, not just uh, those who can visually see them. Um, that takes us to another point, is how can we write good alternative text? So I described this image as a mom dog with her puppy um, uh, laying down uh, next to a pillow. Is that descriptive enough, right? And uh, does it, um, give the other the people listening or the people watching on my website these uh, and reading these images. Does it give them enough information on what I want them to feel or know, right? Depending on products or uh, whatever it might be types of information that you're sharing there. So uh, WCAG uh, two point one is not the uh, final version or standard is changing cons constantly. The 2.2 draft is already out. Um, and then we have a, a 3.0 new standard that's coming that's very different um, or, or designed in a different way, but also is a web accessibility guideline that everybody will move to eventually. Um, it can be uh, overwhelming, and uh, there are a lot of things to do, and that's why hopefully I can give you a small little bits and tips on how to get started uh, today um, with accessibility. And, to, and before we go into that, again, I want to put you in the mood or in the zone by giving you a bit more insight into how a screen reader works for a person who's blind. Uh, and I will check questions if you have any there already. Uh, Abdullah, complex navigation, can it be considered as UI, UX? Yes, definitely. So everybody um, uh, is responsible for accessibility. Anybody on your team who creates content, who designs, who develops, uh, who manages, who uh, publishes marketing, all of them have to be a, a team to, in order to um, um, put good content out there and allow people to use your systems in a good way. Uh, so let me get to the video. Uh, so this one. Hi, this is Jeremy from SSB. And today we're going to talk about how screen reader users navigate websites using heading commands. So if I hit my H key here, the screen reader will be notified that there are headings on this page and it will tell me what the first heading is. I'm going to hit H here. News heading level two link. Ah, and there's the news section. So by all means I should be able to down arrow here and read the page as I normally would. And there should be some news articles. Link troops called to rescue amid Colorado floods. Ah, there we go. Okay. So there is a news story and I could activate that link if I wanted. But I want to see what else is here on the heading. So I'm going to hit the H key again. Sports heading level two link. And then it jumped me past the news section all the way down to the sports section just with one keystroke and we'll verify where we are. Link follow colon free work takes aim at the historic ground. Okay, so we are actually in the sports section now. Entertainment heading level two link. Then I press H and I'm now on the entertainment section. 
So this is one really cool way. This, they've really designed this page to take advantage of jumping around between headings, as I mentioned before, like headlines in a newspaper. They denote sections. Rather than just making the text look big and beautiful, this actually has a purpose. With the proper design, headings can be an integral part of how a screen reader user can get the most out of navigating websites. Okay, so that was an example uh, which I wanted you to see because um, first of all, it's very hard for us to learn how to use screen readers. So, um, seeing other people use them um, on YouTube or wherever um, gives you a lot of information on what makes sense. So, what Bart was doing was tapping through the page or going through the headers of the page. And to him, he was going from up to bottom where he said, okay, well, it moved me from news to sports all the way down the bottom, but he was going on the right side, right? So to some things we can perceive, um, um, it's visually uh, okay for us, but does it make sense to others? And if we can design in a way that it makes sense to people that can't see it, then that's when you're doing a really good thing or you're going on the right way, basically. Um, so moving forward, um, oops. how do I do basic testing for accessibility? Um, so there's a few things that I'll go over, starting with keyboard only testing, then some magnifier, uh, how to do screen, oh, the screen magnifiers, color contrast, alt text, and an automated test uh, platform. Um, and please add your questions as we go, and I will answer them as soon as we finish because I can't see them right now. So keyboard only testing. So the idea with keyboard testing is that um, I need to understand the user. And um, this is where the term user-centered design comes in. It's very critical that I understand the target audiences and what tools they use and put them at the forefront of design before I go in to create them. And by doing that, I can discover problems. I can uh, overcome them early on in the, in the, in the process. Uh, and then hopefully by the time I complete the development, I'm not stuck with something that will require a lot of money and time to fix. Um, so keyboard only testing just basically means that I need to be able to, or I should, put away my mouse, uh, deactivate my um, touchpad, and and work my way through the page using just the buttons on my keyboard. And essentially, uh, keyboard uh, navigation involves tabbing, so I, I use the tab from the URL and tab into a page and walk through it. And it should be um, uh, logical, makes sense. And it should be a linear flow through the page. So I would go, for example, from the logo to hotels, to flights, to holidays, to city breaks, to spas. Then I will go to something like this, um, um, this part of the page, which I could call a landmark or I could develop as a landmark. And call uh, and call out the name of that space and have that as a header, and maybe have this part as a header, which is the booking request form. So I don't need them to go into every part of my page, but I allow them to see what's on the page from a higher level, and then go more in detail if they want to. Okay, uh, and that requires us to annotate the page in a way. Um, that they can see that correct order and understand it, um, and uh, clearly specify the visual focus. Um, so for the people who are um, who can see, um, if I'm tapping through the page using a keyboard and I don't see, for example, a, f a visual box around where I am on the page, then that can cause some confusion. And I'll show a demo in a minute of what I mean. Um, and another thing is um, the same way that I want to be able to see my visual focus, I want people using a keyboard to uh, 
move their keyboard into that focus. So let's say, for example, um, if I clicked uh, if I clicked a button on this page, that's overview, right? Uh, I'm, it might open me a modal. Um, so this modal might dim the background and have me in the front of I have this modal open with a little X button to close it. If my keyboard user, or if I didn't design or develop in a way that the keyboard user moves focus into the modal, then that keyboard user is going to stay on the page and still be able to tab the dimmed space. Uh, and that's violating the principles of accessibility and uh, causing this barrier that the person will not be able to see the overview of the page. Um, so we should ensure that uh, things like that don't happen and that all your interactive elements uh, receive the visual focus, as I mentioned. All right, uh, the next thing is uh, screen magnifiers. So for your pages, um, a good thing to do is to zoom in um, to up to 200, 400 uh, percent and see if your page is still functional. Uh, if it is, then you're doing a good job. Uh, so it's responsive and people can still see without having to go all the way to the right side or all the way to the bottom to see what's on this page. And that's one tip um, uh, to, of accessibility that I will show you as well. I'll leave the demo near the end. The third thing is color contrast. Um, and what we want with color contrast is to make sure that those with a, a, any visual uh, issues can see what's on the page, whether it's small text or large text. Uh, so in the standard, it says any large text should have uh, a ratio of three to one to its background. And any regular text or small text should be at least 4.5 to one contest ratio. So there's tools that do this like the CAA from the Pacello group, and I will um, show you how you can use something like a, a color picker to choose your foreground and your background, and it will give you straight away whether you are um, achieving the contrast expected or not based on the WCAG guideline. Um, all text again. So this is an example of a chart. How do you write an alt text that's uh, uh, understandable by everyone? And so here you have a chart that's divided by color. Someone who might have a, a color blindness will not be able to distinguish between two or three of these colors and the intensities. Um, and the, the colors also um, might be blurred for here. So they will not know which one is a cherry one, which one is a plum one. Um, and I know I chose pies. I'm sorry if you feel hungry. The chart show the description says the chart shows the November pie sales in percentages, and they say cherry is 43%, pe peach is 31, apricot is 18, and plum is 8. And that's pretty self-explanatory for this chart. Um, forms is a is a major issue for screen reader users. There's a lot of tips out there on how to create accessible forms, and some of the basics here um, from an article I took from IDQ, and I'll share this resource. Um, is starting with visible labels and making sure that you have descriptive labels for them. So if I say I want um, the last name, um, they should know that the last name as part of which form, as part of which option. And um, um, the screen reader doesn't read out everything. So maybe it'll read out this label, but in this text box, it might just tell them the type is text and that's it. They don't know what has to go in it. Um, uh, other things are like, for example, group form controls. Um, if I want, for example, um, information, pertaining, let's say, an address that's uh, uh, address one, address two, um, a zip code, and so on. Group them together that way, or in a field set you could use, and that way they will know that they all belong together within uh, this form. And then clearly provide instructions on what they should add and where they need to add it. 
um, uh, I have a lot of difficulty completing forms on a lot of apps here in Kuwait and, and websites. Uh, and I'm, I don't have a, a disability. Uh, I have a lot of issues with uh, completing them on the, a mobile phone versus a website. I much prefer opening my computer to use it and to fill in a form rather than do it on the phone. There's, there's a lot of barriers there. But if I chose or decided to implement it in a way that is accessible, it makes life easier for everyone, not just um, people with disabilities. And the last demo I'll show is the Wave Tool demo. And this is an automated evaluation tool that you can add to, as a Chrome extension or uh, use their website. And that will give you an overview of um, the critical issues you find on a page. One issue with automated tools is that it cannot find everything. So out of, let's say, the 50 success criteria that you need to test for level A and level AA, uh, it'll only give you a fraction of those. So maybe 40% maximum, a 30 to 40%, the wave tool can discover. The rest of them, you need to be able to check yourself. It's a manual process to make sure that you have satisfied the different other uh, problems on that page. All right, so let me see if you have any questions. Is it suitable to use alt tests for videos? If yes, how can how, how we can test how good enough our alt test is? So we don't use alt, alt text for videos. We use closed captions in videos. And what that is, is I take the audio recording and uh, show it as text or transcripts, which means I extract all of the audio into a file and provide that file to people who want to access it um, by adding it as a button, an option on the side, wherever. Uh, so the video players here are different. There's lots of different video players available. Uh, they do pose a challenge to screen readers, and there's a lot of testing that you can do. And if you want, you can ask. Uh, and I'll provide some resources on that later at them. Um, so let's see our first example. So here I've gone to um, the um, GDG webpage, uh, and it's developed by a company, not Google. Um, and this was one of the places I wanted to just demo a few things uh, versus another page. I have two pages to show you. So one thing I wanted to do with color contrast. So I, uh, I add a few um, widgets, uh, I guess you could say, or extensions onto Google Chrome. One of them is um, uh, uh, one that concerns um, color contrast. That helps to see um, whether things on my page, if I rely heavily on color, whether people can see it um, normally versus having an increased contrast versus inverting the colors. Can I see them the same? Do they show up the same? Uh, or, or clearly express my branding even uh, for the company um, and so on. So that was one tool. I told you that I was gonna use, let me disable that and show you the color contrast analyzer. So um, you can download it. Uh, you, there's also extensions for this, uh, Color Contrast Analyzer. And if I go into the color picker, and this is my foreground color picker, and I go and pick, let's say this one, because this blue is little. So I'm going to click on the blue for foreground, and then click on the background, which is light gray. So it tells me. Um, that based on those two colors, it fails for regular text. So this text on this page is too small for people to see. So I need to do something about it, and whether make it bigger, uh, bolder, um, uh, and, and fix that uh, problem uh, to achieve uh, the WCAG uh, guideline for AA, okay? Um, so that's one example. Uh, the other one I said I'd show was the Wave tool. Let's do it on this other website. 
And the wave tool is uh, also comes as an extension and that's what I'll do. I just clicked on extension and it's embedded the wave tool bar and shows me uh, all of the issues that's in the page. It gives me a list of the errors. It gives me a list of any contrast issues uh, and shows me even if I'm using ARIA and which elements I use. So on this page, luckily, because uh, we worked a lot uh, on the ACM campus uh, and the accessibility chair for this conference happening in June. So if you do research, please consider submitting papers to this conference. Um, you can see under details uh, what those issues are. And because there's no problems, I'm going to go to the other web page and show you um, the problems there. Because um, this one didn't do too well. All right, so in underway for uh, our platform, and this is my next project to go tell them what to fix, there's errors, right? So the errors show up uh, as red, and the majority of the errors on this page is the missing alternative text. So it tells you you have 63 missing alternative text, uh, and for each one, where they are and, um, and, and that you need to fix. Another thing it tells you is things like linked uh, image missing alternative text. So for a screen reader going through your page, if there's a link, if it doesn't tell them where it's going to go, then they might move to another page or it might change to a new page and they don't know how to get back. Um, uh, or it might confuse them. Uh, on whether they need to go forward rather than stay on the same page or whether it's going to open a new window or not. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, labels and empty links are also very critical to address. So it gives you a lot of good detail. Um, uh, for example, I believe like our logos didn't have a problem. Yeah, so these were really good. So our sponsor logos went on went up perfectly. So you see, for example, we have KFAS, and um, uh, we tagged it, and um, uh, also have an alternative text that says logo KFAS. And let me show you how to check that. So if I'm at a page like this, and I have an image, you can right click and do something like this and say inspect. Um, and I went to the wrong thing. I want this one. So under KFAS, uh, if I inspect, then I can see some bits of the HTML code um, on how this page was written. And, and this is the only bit of code you're going to see, I swear. So uh, ARIA label is um, the label that gets read to screen readers. And here it says KFAS logo. So anyone that is reading through this page will know they're going past the label that is for some organization. Um, uh, and so on. So that's what we're talking about, basic accessibility um, for pages. Um, what else did I miss? Alt text, color address, screen magnifying. That's another one. All right, so let's see. If I go up to 500 on this page and I go up and down, then yes, I don't need to go right and left. I'm still on the same page. It's adjusted. I can see all of the different parts. It might be longer to reach, but it's it's responsive. All right. Uh, let's see our call for papers. That also is changing uh, up to 500. Works pretty well, and I'm sure it will work equally well when I use a mobile. Okay. And um, so that's it for uh, the demo parts. I'm going to share the link. Um, um, to the, uh, I'm going to share the resources and the link to the um, certificates in a minute. Sorry, I may, I'll, I'll be late doing that. But one thing before I finish with the slides is that there's uh, easy checks. Um, you can go to W3C Easy Checks and, and walk through a lot of these things that need to be done manually. Um, it's an excellent tool and I advise that you use that. And I'll hold on a second.
All right, so I've added the Google Docs form uh, for you to sign up as an attendee, so you can get a certificate for today's event, uh, if that's what you were looking for or you need, uh, plus the resources uh, that I've had I had on uh, my pages. Um, there's another one thing before we end is our takeaway. So I do hope that uh, a lot of the information you've seen today um, is not too much and that you can adopt one or two or even one walking away from here and implementing it all the time in your development or in your design. Um, um, another key factor with talking about accessibility is um, making people aware. Um, awareness is key to change and I believe that um, there's a lot of things we can do um, to make other people aware around us. So please share this talk once, we, once it goes up on YouTube, share it with other people and encourage them to use the resources and, um, uh, and to learn more about how to implement accessibility in their workplace. And the last thing I'd like to request from you all is to take part in um, a digital accessibility survey and that I'm currently uh, running. Uh, it's live, so you can use a QR code uh, or I will, and I will share the link to it uh, shortly. Uh, and that uh, survey, um, until now, we've had very little responses uh, uh, to completion. So we're looking for developers, designers, uh, quality assurance people, anybody that develops content um, at an employee level and those at management level, so your bosses and things like this, could help with helping us understand our level of knowledge in Kuwait for accessibility and um, make them aware of the importance of using it. And so I do encourage you, uh, up to now, uh, one of the highlights of the results, uh, we've had 30 responses for the developers um, level uh, and more than 60% have never heard of the WCAG, so the, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And that's something big. So if, if we are able to do more awareness sessions like this in the future, talk to people a bit more about how to implement it, how to fix things, then I hope that the developed projects that come out into the market uh, are a lot easier to use for everyone and more inclusive specifically to those with disabilities. So um, let me find, um, sorry, I didn't share that screen with you. So here we go. That's the screen and I will get the link to the survey in one second. So please add your questions. Let me know if there's anything at all I can help with or um, um, clear up uh, or explain uh, and that way uh, everybody um, can find it more useful I hope I hope you find today's uh, workshop useful and I will stop recording now to take discussions and answer your questions um, I just added the link uh, right at the bottom um, for the survey. And thanks a lot for joining us today. It was a pleasure getting to know you all. So, uh, um, can someone without coding background learn about digital accessibility or take the certification? Definitely, definitely. So, I just got certified under um, the core competencies for uh, digital for accessibility with the IAAP um, and that was not technical uh, a lot of the information pertaining accessibility at that level uh, is uh, general to uh, the physical accessibility um, the types of disabilities and um, the culture around disabilities as well um, so you learn things such as um, how people view disabilities. So here in Kuwait, for example, we still have a, like the majority of people think of the medical um, um, culture for disability. They have a medical model. Uh, 
And what that means is that they believe that um, people with disabilities are ill and that they need to be fixed or need medicine to fix whatever it is they're suffering from. Whereas um, lots of other cultures are more advanced when it comes to the models and use more of a social culture. So the social culture says, or the social culture of disability says that um, um, the society is responsible for the barriers imposed on people with disabilities. So if I build a building and that building is not accessible, then it's not the fault of the people with disability. Uh, it's not because they're not able, it's because we designed it wrong. We designed it to not include them. Uh, if I uh, create a book and I put it online, if that book is not accessible, if it's a PDF, for example, and the PDFs can be very hard to make accessible, um, and I don't put it in an alter other format, then that also creates a barrier. That person cannot use it. Um, so that's us causing the problem. Uh, and that's where awareness comes in, is how do I change people's perception to think, stop thinking that, okay, there's a f not many percentage-wise of people with disability, but I don't ignore them. I design for everyone because one day I'm going to be old and I'm going to be needing to use um, assistive technologies like a screen or a magnifier, for example, because I will need glasses. And um, uh, I will also, um, I'm not, um, I don't know for sure that I might not lose a finger or break a finger and not be able to use my right hand, which is my main hand. How am I able to use technologies using mobiles or my keyboard on my left hand if I'm not capable of doing that for a period of time? If it's not designed in a way that thinks about these temporary disabilities, then it's gonna be a barrier for me. And, I, and that's why I care so much um, that, and encourage you to go do um, these types of certifications. What's the name of the certification? Um, uh, IAPCC, CPAC. I'll just give you the link. Um, there's so many resources on there on how to study for it. The body of knowledge is all available. Um, um, so you can download it and study it by yourself. And DQ have an awesome course to walk you through it. That's the resource I used. Um, I've just added the link for you. Uh, you've also got um, the next level, which is more technical and accessibility. Um, that's the web accessibility specialist, and that requires knowledge in things like uh, CSS, HTML, ARIA, um, and basic development um, uh, to show competence in developing with accessibility in mind. So I hope that answered your question. Um, Right, and I've added the links, so I think I'm good uh, up to now. Anybody with any other question? Right, I hope you filled the form for your certificate, and um, I'll call it tonight and say good night. Um, I'll keep it open two more minutes just in case anybody has last questions and types them up. But otherwise, I wish you a great weekend. I am a person with disabilities, so this topic is very important to me, thanks. I definitely agree, and if you need anything, please contact me at any time. My email's on there. I believe we, we already connected um so best of luck in your endeavors and uh, promote it to other people so please share those links with other people and let them know and uh, what's out there and how they could apply it especially if they're making a, a difference thank you mariam oh, great arivand i will definitely look for your name
Thank you all, Fatma Susan. Have a great night.